uh, Rula Deep to share the screen and uh, start our presentation. Great, thank you so much, Krishna, for the kind introduction. And also, uh, thank you for your leadership in organizing these webinars. Um, the lineup looks amazing. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, PFAS treatment challenges and opportunities today. Um, and a quick presentation outline, just a very brief overview of what PFAS are. Then I'm going to move on to some of the challenges and uh, spend the majority of my time discussing treatment opportunities, starting with how we can optimize conventional uh, treatment technologies and a treatment train approach to, to increase um, PFAS removal efficiency and decrease costs. I'm going to give a case study of an innovative application of a conventional treatment technology. Then I'm going to talk about some of the research and development efforts that are um, trying to advance the state of knowledge and practice regarding PFAS destructive technologies. And I'm going to end with the use of a lines of evidence approach to confirm uh, PFAS treatment uh, efficacy. So we're going to start with PFAS. As Krishna, as Krishna said, uh, PFAS is current poly, polyfluoroalkyl substances. So it, it is a plural. We, le, we refer to PFAS as R. Um, there are over um, 8,000 known individual PFAS substances. The definition of what PFAS constitutes keeps changing. It's different in Europe than it is in the U.S., um, so the number also keeps changing. Um, it's gone up from the hundreds to the thousands and may very well exceed 10,000 individual uh, compounds. Uh, really briefly, though, there's two families of concern. There's the polyfluoroalkyl substances. That means not every carbon is fluorinated on the uh, chemical chain, but then there's the perfluoroalkyl substances and those are the one where every carbon is fluorinated. Uh, and because of the strong carbon fluorine bond, this makes um, these compounds very persistent in the environment because that carbon fluorine bond is so hard to break under natural conditions. So for the most part, the perfluoroalkyl uh, compounds are terminal products in the environment. Um, and the two most famous PFAS is PFOA and PFOS. They're eight carbon chain perfluoroalkyl substances and they do not degrade in the environment. All PFAS are synthetic, so they're man-made. Uh, they've been manufactured since the 1940s and widely used in a lot of the commercial products that we use every day. You're looking here at a picture of dental floss. For example, glide is referred to as glide because it's coated with PFAS and therefore it um, glides very easily between your teeth when you're cleaning your teeth. Your nonstick pots and pans are coated with PFAS. The reason um, oil does not leak through wrappers at fast food restaurants is because the wrappers and the pizza boxes and the uh, butter um, packaging is all coated uh, with PFAS. So as I mentioned, thousands of PFAS in use uh, since as early as the 1940s, but the detection of these compounds in the environment is much more recent over the last two decades because traditional um, methodologies utilized to detect other contaminants like petroleum hydrocarbons or chlorinated solvents, they do not pick up PFAS. So we started observing foaming in wells at uh, contaminated sites that led us to look for um, the compounds responsible in PFAS because of the polar um, and nonpolar head and tail that they have. They have surfactant properties, which is, which is what led for us to look for them and measure them in the environment using advanced analytical methodologies. So let's talk a little bit about PFAS uses. They're widely used because they're, ver they're very unique physical and chemical properties. Uh, and because of their um, uh, durability, they're used in a lot of products. So electronics, um, they offer life-saving protection. 
in uh, safety gear and uh, firefighting foams used by first response responders. They're used at oil and gas terminals to help put out uh, fuel-based fires um, and to coat certain materials, um, the automotive industry, semiconductor industry, the healthcare um, industry in pacemakers and defibrillators and MRI imaging devices. Um, your clothing from REI, um, the reason it's soil resistant and waterproof is because it's coated with PFAS. So widely used products uh, because of these physical and chemical properties. And this wide usage really leads to the widespread environmental occurrence. One of the most uh, important uses of PFAS is in aqueous foam forming foams or AFFF. These foams are used at airports by the military and at um, uh, fuel storage uh, terminals um, because uh, of their film forming um, capabilities. So if you have a fuel fire, these foams that are used to extinguish the fires spread very quickly because of the surfactant properties of PFAS. They spread quickly over a fuel-based fire and they prevent contact between the fuel and the air and they snuff out a fire very, very effectively. Water in these situations or other chemicals don't work as well. So PFAS um, are used in AFFF uh, for uh, its uh, very effective spreading properties and its ability to put out a fire very quickly. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the treatment challenges before we start talking about uh, the treatment opportunities, which is the exciting part of this presentation. Uh, PFAS are referred to as forever chemicals, again, because of that strong carbon fluorine bond, um, which is the strongest bond in nature. So they tend to be really persistent, and that's why they're referred to as forever chemicals. And if you're interested in learning more about PFAS, um, there's a really good documentary called The Devil, the Devil We Know, as well as a movie that was released a few years ago called Dark Waters. Another treatment challenge is the contaminant footprint. This is some early data from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, a fire training area that's located right here where the Purple Star is. The releases of foam, firefighting foam, at this fire training area happened in 1970. So we're looking at data five decades later and uh, over a distance of um, over a thousand feet concentrations of the two PFAS that we're tracking are 885 nanograms per liter. And at the source area, five to six decades later, the concentrations are, are still uh, over 300,000 nanograms per liter. And the really important thing to remember here is EPA is proposing maximum contaminant levels or MCLs for PFOS and PFOA of four nanograms per liter, not micrograms per liter, not milligrams per liter. So very low levels, nanograms per liter. So you'd, you'll see that 60 years later in the subsurface environment, the concentrations are orders of magnitude at the source area higher than the proposed MCL and down gradient at a distance, they're still really high. So you have a contaminant footprint that's really large uh, because of when the releases have occurred um, and uh, we're treating to really low levels potentially once the MCLs are finalized by the EPA. So just to kind of uh, emphasize what part per trillion or nanogram per liter is, that's the equivalent of one drop of PFAS in a 20 in 20 Olympic size swimming pools. So very low levels of PFAS is what EPA is looking to regulate um, to. So in the absence of federal um, regulatory targets, uh, a lot of the states have been coming up with their own way of regulating PFAS. They're either coming up with uh, regulatory stand standards that are enforceable and they vary from one state to the other, but they're also coming up with different ways of regulating PFAS, like either as a group in one state um, or um, individually in other states. So it would be really interesting to see 
uh, what's going to happen once EPA finalizes its proposed MCLs at the end of the year. That's, that's their target. Other treatment challenges is if you look at, for example, fire training areas, something had to be set on fire to be for the fire training, for the firefighting foams, for the firefighters to practice putting them out. So a lot of the a lot of the sites that are contaminated with PFAS also have petroleum hydrocarbons or chlorinated solvents. So the presence of PFAS in complex mixtures really complicates uh, treatment. Plus, PFAS is only a small percentage in uh, of, of materials and firefighting foams is only about 3%. So there's a lot of other compounds in firefighting foams and those have to be taken into consideration because they do impact treatment efficacy. Other things that tr impact treatment include background constituents like metals and sulfate and total organic carbon that are often present at much higher concentrations than the PFAS. So we're looking at PFAS at part per trillion levels, but these other constituents in groundwater or stormwater or surface water are present in part per million uh, concentrations. Conventional technologies like granule activated carbon or GAC and ion exchange or IX do work for PFAS, but the cost um, is uh, orders of magnitude higher. And we have to remember that these conventional technologies produce concentrated waste streams that then have to be dealt with. And there are um, operation and maintenance considerations that have to be uh, taken into account because of frequent media change outs and uh, waste disposal issues. Lots of exciting work in the destructive PFAS uh, space. And I'm gonna give you some case studies of R&D projects that are funded by the Department of Dis Defense and links to all these web pages if you'd like to refer to them in the future. Uh, but a lot of them are still being developed and have not been tested in, at the full scale level in the field. So let's start with um, how conventional treatment technologies can be optimized. I'm gonna give you three case studies. One, uh, all three involve a treatment train, train approach to, to optimize um, efficiency and cost and all emphasize the pretreatment uh, aspect in order to uh, minimize uh, the operation and maintenance costs associated with granule activated carbon media change out and ion exchange change out. This first uh, case study is from a site we're working on in upstate New York at an airport where they had a release of a fluorotelomer um, foam, a triple F foam. Um, we were tasked, they had an accidental release of a triple F that made it into a surface water receiving body and impacted stormwater at the site. So we were asked to um, look at treatment options uh, and evaluate a short-term um, treatment solution as well as long-term uh, treatment measures and costs. So what we ended up doing at that site is we designed a 300 GPM treatment system for the stormwater uh, to try and intercept it before it gets into surface water. Um, and uh, that involved uh, a pre-design investigation and testing, uh, permitting, which was a really big um, uh, component at the site, and ongoing uh, performance monitoring. To date, the system has treated more than 10 million gallons of impacted stormwater, and that was really successful um, and cost effective because of the pre-treatment components that we implemented to try and um, optimize uh, or increase the lifetime of the GAC and ion exchange system. So pre-treatment included ultrafiltration, and these are some of the results for PFOS. Again, the influent PFOS is on the order of 100,000 nanograms per liter, and we're trying to treat down to the four nanograms per liter. Actually, New York has its own standards for PFOS. So ideally non-detect. So you'll see that we were able to decrease PFOS. That's just the data that we're showing from uh, influent concentrations uh, that were very high to very low uh, subpart per trillion levels. And you'll see that 
over the course of the treatment frame, um, after ultrafiltration and GAC, you knock down the concentration a little bit, and then ion exchange really helps, but because of the total suspended solids that the PFAS attach, um, attached to back filters um, were really important to kind of knock down that concentration to the levels that we were aiming uh, to treat to. So the good news here is that conventional treatment technologies when implemented uh, properly uh, really helps um, de knock down the, the levels uh, of uh, uh, PFOS and other target PFAS. So uh, the running the uh, the two conventional treatment technologies, the granule activated carbon and ion exchange. So these are both uh, sorption based uh, technologies. Uh, the granule activated carbon is not. Um, removes PFAS and other stuff, but the ion exchange um, really targets the ionic PFAS. Uh, a lot of them are, some are anionic, some are um, zwitterionic. So it's a really um, a special formulation of resin that we tested and implemented at that site with good results. So uh, really uh, shifting to pretreatment. So initially, uh, organic carbon was really high in the stormwater. And we, uh, this is a fluorocalmer foam. So it has a lot of ethylene glycol in it. So what we tried to do is we were collecting the, the stormwater in frac tanks. Uh, and to try and knock down the total organic carbon in those frac tanks, we added, we tried to um, add uh, a lot of stuff, and I'll describe what stuff I'm talking about here, in the frac tanks to turn them into bioreactors. So we added urea pellets, uh, some amendments like phosphoric acid, uh, sources of nitrogen and phosphorus pretty much, and then two microbial cultures to try and knock down the concentration of the organic carbon in those frac tanks before they went through the GAC and ion exchange uh, vessels. And biotreatment really allowed us to reduce the TOC concentrations, as you can see in the figure to the far right, to optimize treatment. The second pretreatment step that we did was using back filters before the GAC. Um, and uh, that also helped with bed life and removal efficiency of the gap. So I cannot emphasize uh, enough the importance of pretreatment, especially if you have complex uh, water matrices like a stormwater or surface water, in some cases, groundwater. So that's the lesson learned from that site, and that system has been operating for over three years. Uh, this next uh, case study is a confidential site in Wisconsin. It's a fire training college. So a lot of fire training activities over the decades where different kinds of foams having PFAS were used. Uh, and that led to uh, widespread surface water and groundwater contamination. Um, so in this case, um, we designed a 300 gallon per minute groundwater extraction and treatment system to capture and treat the PFAS impacted groundwater. And again, in this case, pretreatment was a very important component that included clarification, metals removal, and filtration. That was followed by GAC, then ion exchange, and solids handling towards the, the end. Pre-design included um, a lot of investigation and testing, uh, design of the well network um, collection uh, system, the conveyance pi piping, and then of course the treatment system permitting and then construction during COVID, which I can tell you was a lot of fun because of all the um, supply chain issues. Uh, so it was a fast track project execution we had 12 months between design and successful startup because of the um, uh, community uh, engagement issues. The, the client in this case was very anxious 
to uh, to try and, and capture the PFAS impacted groundwater and treat it to non-detect levels. And then we had three months after the system startup, three months of startup and optimization to further enhance uh, efficacy. So we've treated 60 million gallons uh, as of August 2023 with no exceedances as far as the um, discharge um, levels uh, that were expected, which again, were on the order of nanograms per liter. And we did during that period of uh, you know, optimization, we added um, a pilot line dosing system to enhance the performance of the filter press and the slush dewatering system. So what you're looking at here is PFOS and PFOA in nanograms per liter on the y-axis, and then treatment over time, influent concentrations um, varied over time. But again, when we're treating down to four nanograms per liter, five orders of magnitude higher than target levels. Um, and we were able to effectively treat down to point 48 nanograms per liter with a target treatment of 0.48 or four nanograms per liter. So really good system performance, again, to showcase that you can use conventional treatment technologies to remove PFAS, but pretreatment and optimization are really key. And so are uh, the reliance on the use of a treatment train approach to reduce uh, media change out. So I want to shift gears a little bit to an innovative application of a conventional treatment technologies. This is work that we did in North Carolina for a manufacturing client who operated a plant and uh, PFAS was manufactured at that plant. And unfortunately, it made it into a receiving uh, water body adjacent to the site. So the goal there was to try and uh, mitigate impacts to both groundwater and to the surface water body that was uh, capturing a lot of the uh, groundwater. The solution there was to try and design an in-situ gravity powered treatment system that relies on adsorption. And um, we were trying to capture the flow from four uh, seeps at the site that were discharging into the river with concentrations of PFAS from 100 to roughly 230 micrograms per liter was the concentration of PFAS in, in those surface water seeps. So what we did is we designed an impoundment uh, basin that captured the flow from the four seeps, and then the impoundment uh, basin um, drained to two uh, flow through cells with granule activated carbon. We did a lot of bench scale testing to find the best carbon for the type of uh, PFAS in the, um, in the water that was being uh, captured. So the flow enters via the impoundment basin, basin flows vertically through the gap. And we had two beds and they could alternate league lag duty cycles. Uh, and again, the beauty of the system here is we were able to rely on gravity to capture the flow. So it was a very low cost system. Um, the goal here was to minimize uh, cost and maximize efficiency. Plus, we had only six months to design and operate that system. And what you're looking at here are days of operation, the influent concentrations of PFAS and the four, P, uh, four seeps, the affluent um, average in micrograms per liter well below the target MCLs, and the average removal efficiency uh, exceeding. 98% for all uh, seeps, and we've removed over 400 um, uh, pounds of, of PFAS um, from, uh, from this, the site at, at this point. So this is a really scalable technology in terms of uh, you could do a form to fit type solution for the site. Um, of course, you have to have gravity working for you if you wanna implement it, but really effective sort of a little bit out of a box, out of the box implementation of a conventional treatment technology. As far as reducing the mass flux into the river, you can see here that um, uh, we're seeing uh, reductions of mass flux into the receiving water body that are 
very significant um, over time. Our goal was to reduce it mass flux by 80% and we're exceeding 95% um, average removal uh, based on um, river flow. So um, let's shift gears now to uh, where we're at as an industry in terms of uh, the, the quest to develop PFAS destructive technologies. Now, when if you recall, when we talked about PFAS and their physical chemical properties, because of that carbon fluorine bond, it's really hard to break it. So for example, if you're relying on a thermal technology uh, like incineration, uh, incineration for PFAS weights, uh, waste is really um, requires temperatures exceeding 1000 degrees C, not 1000 degrees F to break that very strong and persistent bond. So to, to leverage some of the thermal technologies, uh, this is an example of a smoldering technology that was developed by um, uh, Savron um, and in collaboration with uh, several universities in Canada. Um, I included on all of these slides hyperlinks to the uh, project web pages. This is all work that is funded by the Department of Defense. So if you click on any of these hyperlinks, it'll take you to a web page that includes any final reports from these projects, showcasing the technology performance, as well as costs, any publications that came out of these projects, and the principal in charge, um, their contact information. If you're any interested in any of these technologies, I'd encourage you to get the slides from uh, Krishna and uh, follow the links provided to you in these slides. So smoldering um, involves temperatures at over 900 degrees C. It has both in-situ and ex-situ applications. It's a technology that has been shown and demonstrated for other contaminants like uh, tar um, and DNAPLE and NAPLE. Um, so tested technology for a lot of other PFAS, the beauty of what Savron is doing in this case is that they're worked with these universities to try and close the mass balance for PFAS. And they were able to demonstrate that they're breaking PFAS into um, harmless byproducts. So no uh, concerns regarding emissions of uh, any PFAS that are not fully uh, decomposed. So the R&D objectives were to demonstrate PFAS destruction using surrogate fuels, in this case, uh, spent activated carbon that is loaded with PFAS or sand and soil that are loaded is that is loaded with PFAS. And for ex situ, um, for in situ um, demonstrations and next steps, they're gonna inject vegetable oil, use that as the fuel to smolder and in the process, get rid of PFAS. So um, there are some publications on this technology out there. This is just one example. Um, really promising results showcasing that the majority of PFAS for the pilot scale systems uh, was converted to hydrogen fluoride. Um, so complete mineralization, no PFAS breakthrough in the emissions collection system. Um, they looked at the progression of PFAS, a destruction over time and the conversion of PFAS from long chain PFAS to shorter chain PFAS and work is continuing to kind of close that mass balance. The next steps, and the, there's a hyperlink to uh, the second project that is um, on that first slide. The next step is to try and demonstrate this technology in situ at Edwards Air Force Base in California. And, different uh, fuel mixtures are going to be considered, including uh, vegetable oil. So they're in the process of designing the pilot uh, test system, uh, followed by installation and operation, and data should be available in about a year. So I'd encourage you to visit those web pages. But really exciting because of the potential for in-situ applications um, and also the potential for complete destruction of PFAS. Uh, this next technology relies, it's a two-step process. This is work that we're doing in collaboration with a young, brilliant professor at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Her name is Megan Hart. 
And this is a two-step technology that relies on PFAS immobilization on a granule media. And this granule media has an embedded catalyst. And when you expose it to UV, the catalyst then breaks down PFAS uh, completely. Um, the beauty of this technology, it can work on very concentrated and dirty liquid waste streams. So you can use it for straight AFFF or if you have a waste from an ion exchange system. So the concentrated PFAS that comes off the uh, regenerated ion exchange, that can be used to completely destroy that. So you can either use it for landfill leachate with PFAS or um, in a treatment train approach with a conventional technology or for straight AFFF. So lots of exciting results coming from the lab at this point. We've been funded to go into the field to demonstrate this technology um, at, at a um, Cheever Air Force Base in Colorado and also at Willow Grove in, uh, on, it's a Navy site uh, on the East Coast. And I'm showing you here data uh, the progression of uh, treatment. Uh, you'll see what we're getting from the water, uh, the sort of the IX re regenerate or still bottoms. This is what it looks like before treatment. It's really dark in color. And as it goes through the reactor, the color changes. And we go to completely non-detect uh, of PFAS in that uh, wastewater. So really good removal. We're trying to optimize a treatment uh, to bet, and we're trying to better understand the impact of um, co-contaminants on PFAS removal kinetics. Uh, and again, you could, uh, there, there's, uh, you could click on this link or uh, look at a publication by Hannah McIntyre, uh, who's the PhD student uh, that did this work to learn more about this technology. Um, this next technology is a hydrothermal treatment technology. It operates at about 400 degrees C, but it requires an alkaline solution. So this is work that we're doing with the Colorado School of Mines with Professor Tim Strathman, the University of Washington, and a company that is trying to commercialize this technology called Aquaga. Again, there are a number of publications on the link to the web page here to get additional treatment. But this is another technology that can destroy both the uh, PFOS-like PFOS compounds, so the sulfonic acids, in addition to PFOA-like compounds, which are the carboxylic uh, acids. So it works really well for long chain and short chain removal uh, of PFAS. So you're looking at data here with very high removal for a range uh, of PFAS, um, going from port, uh, short chain to long chain, including that carboxylic acids as well as the sulfonic acids. So um, good defluorination um, uh, and leading to complete uh, destruction and no uh, byproducts form. And then this last technology that I want to talk about um, is uh, called P-Phaser. This is a physical chemical top technology that, again, works in two steps, concentrates PFAS first, and then leads to disposal and destruction. Uh, unlike a lot of the conventional technologies, uh, no pretreatment is required here. So this will lend some cost effectiveness when it moves to the full scale. And this is work in um, conjunction with uh, Calcon Systems and the University of Waterloo. And you're looking at a treatment efficiency or treatment results for a range of PFAS, short chain, long chain acids, um, both carboxylic and sulfonic, and then some of the fluoropolymers that are present in foams. You're looking at data from two sites, influent concentrations really, really high um, and removal efficiencies that are really promising. And we're working to try and optimize that before we pilot this technology. Now, these are not the only technologies that are being funded um, and developed for PFAS destruction. The Department of Defense through its research arms, CERDAP and ESCCP, is funding a lot of work. I would direct you to go to certup-esccp.org. Um, 
you'll see this sort of interactive map of all the statements of need that have been funded between 2011 and 2023. And for example, if you go and click on um, uh, thermal destruction technologies for trade AFFF on that box, it'll take you to all the PFAS thermal technology or PFAS destructive thermal technologies that have been funded by DOD. And then you click on each one and it takes you to the web page with any final reports or any webinars or blogs or publications. So it's a really useful website for those of you that are just um, getting um, familiarized with uh, PFAS treatment. So significant uh, investment by the Department of Defense on the order of over $100 million of R&D money that's been dedicated to this area of PFAS and also AFFF replacement foams. So the quest to try and find PFAS-free forms that work well. And uh, the goal is for the DOD to switch from AFFF to fluorine free foams at a lot of their sites in the next over the next few years. They're just starting to certify the foams. So you'll see that there's information on PFAS free uh, foams um, on this website also. So just to conclude here, um, if you're considering, um, especially uh, a, a destructive technologies, we highly recommend using a lines of evidence approach to assess uh, effectiveness uh, of, of said technology uh, in collaboration with UC Berkeley, Oregon State University, and the Colorado School of Mines with funding from DOD. We've developed a free guidance that can be downloaded at this website. Um, it's titled Lines of Evidence to Assess the Effectiveness of PFAS Remedial Technologies. It's a three lines of evidence approach to try and uh, really uh, confirm claims of success um, for a lot of these destructive technologies. So a lot of the tools to try and evaluate technologies are present on this website. And again, they're free for download and we've pilot tested them uh, with a lot of the um, uh, technology vendors that have PFAS destructive technologies. There's a final report uh, that can also be downloaded in addition to different uh, worksheets. So I'd really encourage you to look very carefully at these three lines of evidence. One is a decrease in target PFAS concentrations that can be explained in the context of a mass balance, a treatment mechanism that is proposed and consistent uh, with previous studies and supported by data in the literature, and then the whole issue of PFAS transformation products, making sure that you're destroying, you're not forming byproducts or uh, precipitating out of some of the salts. Um, so a mass balanced approach that is aimed at identifying tracking byproducts. So to summarize, conventional PFAS treatment approaches are effective for drinking water, stormwater, and groundwater pretreatment is really critical to optimize performance of conventional technologies and we've seen that a treatment train approach in most cases is the best way to go, but we really recommend doing some bench scale studies to identify the right kind of carbon and the right kind of ion exchange resin to use depending on the uh, source of PFAS in your media. Uh, R&D efforts primarily funded by DOD are focused on the sort of next generation technologies which are aimed to destroy uh, which are aimed at destroying PFAS keep in mind that some of these technologies are still in the early development stages while others are currently being demonstrated at military sites impacted by firefighting phones so definitely keep checking these sort of ESCCB websites for update on the performance and cost of implementing these technologies and a lines of evidence approach is important to assess uh, PFAS treatment efficacy, very uh, critical. And just ending on a positive note, uh, we all like to talk about PFAS uh, challenges, but we as an industry are not in the uh, business of selling problems. I really think we can overcome the PFAS treatment challenges and a lot of the PFAS treatment technologies uh, advancements 
um, are taking place uh, when we see academic um, collaborators uh, working very closely with industry with a lot of support from the regulatory community. So a at a lot of the sites where we're testing these um, promising destructive technologies, the collaboration with academic partners and buying from the regulatory community has been really important in propelling these technologies forward. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I've also included my phone number and email address, and I'm happy to discuss questions offline with folks that don't want to ask them now. But I'll turn it back to you, Krishna. Yeah. If you'd like thank me to you. answer any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Rula, for excellent presentation. Uh, I know you covered a lot of interesting things. Um,